Hello, this is Joe Ix, Professor in Chief of the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at UC San Diego. I'll be discussing the publication, Effects of Etelcalcitide versus Placebo on Serum Parathyroid Hormone in Patients Receiving Hemodialysis with Secondary Hyperparathyroidism. Two randomized clinical trials. The manuscript is authored by Jeff Block and colleagues, and the study was reported in JAMA. I selected this article to discuss because this study evaluates the, the effects of, IV, of an IV cal calcium mimetic, etel calcitide, and compares it with placebo on serum parathyroid hormone concentrations in patients receiving hemodialysis. The study showed that etel calcitide, a synthetic peptide, was more effective than placebo to have a greater than 30% reduction in PTH concentrations in patients with secondary hyperparathyroidism. So this, were, this study evaluated two parallel phase three randomized multicenter placebo-controlled studies involving adult patients receiving hemodialysis with moderate to severe secondary hyperparathyroidism. The trials were quite similar. Trial A was conducted in 508 patients at 111 sites in the US, Canada, Europe, Israel, Russia, and Australia. And trial B was conducted in 515 patients at 97 sites in the same countries. The trials were identical except pre-dialysis and post-dialysis laboratory data and elect electrocardiograms were obtained in trial A, and only pre-dialysis measurements were obtained in trial B. Thus, they're presented together. Exclusion criteria included patients who had not received Sinicalcet during the four weeks prior to the first screening, and the use of co commercial Sinicalcet was prohibited during the study. All patients received standard care with phosphate binders and calcitriol or active vitamin D analogs. Etel calcitide or placebo was administered IV after each hemodialysis session for 26 weeks. The primary endpoint was the proportion of patients receiving greater than 30% reduction from baseline in mean PTH during weeks 20 to 27. And secondary endpoints were the proportion of patients receiving achieved mean PTH of 30, I'm sorry, of 300 picograms per ml or lower. 1,023 patients were randomized one to one to receive either placebo or etel calcitide by an interactive voice and web based response system. <clears throat> patients had a mean age of 58 years and 60% were men. The starting dose was 5 milligrams, and it could be increased by 2.5 or 5 milligram increments at weeks 5, 9, 13, and 17, based on PTH and calcium results obtained during the prior week to achieve pre-dialysis PTH of 300 picograms of per ml or lower. Investigators were blinded to PTH and phosphate results. Greater than 50% of etel calcitide treated patients achieved the greater than 30% reduction in serum PTH in less than six weeks, compared to only 9% of placebo treated patients. Reductions in PTH were rapid and sustained over 26 weeks in the etel calcitide treated patients. And treatment with etel calcitide decreased serum intact FGF23 and decreased bone specific alkaline phosphatase and collagen type 1 cross-linked C telopeptide. Most common adverse events were reductions in serum calcium as well as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Overall, 92% of the etel calcitide treated patients experienced adverse events compared to 80% in the placebo group. Etel calcitide was more effective than placebo in lowering PTH concentrations in patients receiving dialysis who had secondary hyperparathyroidism but future research is needed to assess the clinical outcomes as well as the long-term efficacy and safety. Here are the main points of the study from my perspective. <clears throat> this is a companion paper to a, another paper reported previously. Here, etel calcitide is compared, compared to placebo in hemodialysis patients. This allows one to isolate the biochemical effects of this drug in isolation. Etel calcitide but potently lowered PTH concentrations in hemodialysis patients. It also substantially lowered serum calcium concentrations, leading to co-intervention with more frequent use of calcium-based oral phosphate binders 
activated vitamin D com compounds, and higher dialysate calcium baths. Etel calcitide also substantially lowered FGF23 concentrations, and although the number of events was a low, was low, there was a numerically higher rate of hospitalization for heart failure in the etel calcitide treated group. How do these results impact the current state of patient management? Etel calcitide is only the second calcium mimetic to be brought to the market and the first to provide an IV route of administration. The half-life is 48 to 72 hours, allowing for intermittent IV dosing after hemodialysis, which should improve compliance and provide more predictable biochemical response laboratories, facilitating better management of CKD MBD. How do the results of this study impact the future state of patient management? The study shows that etel calcitide significantly lowers serum PTH concentrations and FGF23 concentrations. FGF23 has been associated with left ventricular hypertrophy and higher risk of heart failure. This study provides an opportunity to test etel calcitide as a method to lower FGF23 in an effort to lower the risk of heart failure in future studies. With that stated, a number of questions remain unanswered. Hypocalcemia was more frequent in the etel calcitide treated group, even in the setting of a closely monitored clinical trial. Whether hypocalcemia is more frequent with etel calcitide in routine clinical care remains unanswered, and cl clinicians should closely monitor calcium concentrations when this drug is initiated. While suppression of PTH phosphate and FGF23 are thought to be beneficial, the co-intervention of higher calcium-based binder use, activated, activated vitamin D use, and higher calcium dialysate baths may have secondary adverse consequences. Future studies are needed to determine the net benefits or harms for CVD events and all-cause mortality associated with etel calcitide use. Like in the companion study, I'm sorry, etel calcitide treated patients had numerically higher numbers of hospitalizations for heart failure. And although the number of hospitalizations was small, close monitoring for fluid status and heart failure risk is required in future studies as well as in clinical practice.